Good afternoon, everyone. I have two short things at the top, then we'll get to your questions. First, on Turkey, the United States condemns yesterday's bombings in Kazol Tepe and Diyar Bakr. We offer our condolences to the families of the victims and wish a quick recovery to the many injured. Secondly, on a happier note, we're pleased to welcome to today's press briefing a group of Haitian journalists who are participating in a week-long USAID-sponsored training on health journalism at VOA Creole Service. It's a pleasure to have you guys here. Bienvenue. Um, let's see. We could start with Ukraine or Turkey. It's up to you, you my have friend. A, well, since you mentioned Turkey in your opening, we'll start with Let's start with Turkey. Turkey. Um, you will have seen the Turks have proposed joint operations, military operations, whatever that means, with uh, the Russians in Syria, and I'm wondering if you <clears throat> have any thoughts about that. Well, we've seen those reports, certainly. We remain in close contact with our Turkish allies um, and our partners in the fight against Daesh. You know, we've been clear if um, – work against Daesh, against ISIL, is a priority for all of us. You know, if this is truly um, a step in that direction, we would welcome that. Okay. So you don't have any fundamental – as long as it, it takes that form, you, you wouldn't have an issue with it? You know, you as we problem. remain in coordination with all the members of the anti-ISIL coalition, you know, uh, this would be part of that, and we would welcome that. Okay. And, and what about suggestions from um, some Turkish officials that they're looking to expand uh, – I don't know if replace is actually the right word, but at least at the moment – but expand their non-NATO um, defense and security cooperation? Is that, a, is, is that an issue for you guys? Well, you know, Turkey's been a member of NATO since 1952. Um, it is um, a tremendous member of the alliance. It's a framework nation in Afghanistan. Um, we've stood shoulder to shoulder with our Turkish allies, you know, not only in Afghanistan, but in training, in exercises around the world. You know, is, is Turkey uh, – I've seen the comments on that. I'd refer you to the Turkish government uh, for more information. Um, a fundamental tenet of, of NATO is interoperability. We believe it's important that NATO countries procure military equipment that's interoperable with NATO systems. So I'd, I'd point you to the Turks to, to clarify that. Okay. Do, 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 do you know – does the, when you talk about interoperable equipment, does that basically mean U.S.-made equipment? No. So, so a lot of the it, NATO equipment that you see or, or NATO standard is actually a, a formal standard. Um, it doesn't have to be U.S.-made equipment, though, of course, as an American, I'm always happy to see U.S. equipment, um, but it's a NATO standard. So this stuff that you're talking about is made in other NATO countries as well? So it depends on what it is. As I said, NATO, NATO interoperable equipment is, is a well-recognized standard when you're taking a look at military hardware in order to assure when we go out on exercises, when, you know, we do have to actually use this equipment, that interoperability is a fundamental sort of bedrock of NATO. Right. But primarily the, the country that manufactures most NATO interoperable equipment and meets that standard is the United States. Right? The United States is a major, you know, defense manufacturer. So basically you would like – you're saying you would like to see the Turks buy American. I always, and, uh, as an American, like to see people buy American. All right. But interoperable is, is our bottom line. The last thing, uh, this is kind of to do with uh, with Turkey, well, more to do with Syria. Uh, I'll wait. So okay, good. Uh, Turkey, we'll get Turkey, and then if you guys are Turkey, we'll go to Turkey. Thanks. Okay, yeah. let me go. Let me go to Russia today uh, first. Two two weeks ago, Brett McGurk said the U.S. didn't want Russia to join the anti-ISIL coalition. Mm -hmm. Today, Turkey invited Russia to engage in joint anti-ISIL operations. Did Turkey break ranks? No, I think I just answered this question. Okay. But did uh, – um, what, what is – what is the if, if We've been to very that clear that, that. that if um, Russia is interested in fighting against ISIL, which, you know, they've said they want to do, that we would welcome that. Did Turkey communicate with Washington prior to making that offer to Russia? I have no communications on that. Well, to as, as, as you said, in Russia – <laughs> Turkey is a NATO ally. It is a member of the U.S.-led coalition. It mm -hmm. is offering joint 
uh, operations. Does that mark a change in the coalition strategy? As we've said, and, and I just said, you know, we have been very clear that if Russia is really interested in taking the fight to ISIL, to combating a terror threat that frankly involves the entire global community, we would welcome their interest in that. You know, we've, we've had doubts in the past. You know, let's see where this goes. Can Saeed? I, well, yeah, I have yeah. The short answer to the, her question, does this change the strategy, is no, right? No, or exactly. It, it doesn't change. Yeah, it doesn't. Saeed. I just wanted to ask you to comment on a statement attributed to uh, President Erdogan in which he's suggesting that you guys must choose between Gulen or Turkey. I wonder if you have any comments on that. Yeah, I, I wouldn't speak specifically mm -hmm. to that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you're asking fundamentally about, about the question of extradition, right. which we've spoken a lot about. You know, I, I would point out an extradition treaty has two signatories, right. you know, two partners who have engaged in this. It's a legal, technical process. It's very clear how this process unfolds. It's not influenced by emotion. It's not influenced by politics. You know, we have received documents. We are continue to review them, and we continue to be in close touch with our Turkish friends on this. But it's a process that is governed by the law in the legal system. Mm -hmm. So Let's let me see. ask you then, if it is so clear, mm -hmm. why is it that the president of Turkey or, you know, Turkish officials is having such a hard time understanding this very basic legal uh, process? Do you think maybe because uh, this Turkish president wants to get as much mileage as possible out oh, of this Sayyid, I crisis. couldn't talk to that. No, I, I, I would, I would direct that, you to why the Turks. Why do you think, why do they, you think they keep putting it? Why do they, you know, ignore this thing? Because you keep saying that this is a lengthy process, mm -hmm. it's a legal process in which it must go through and so on. Why do, you, why do they insist that you must do this I, right I couldn't, away? I couldn't, you know, even start to, to project my own opinion. On, on what uh, comments coming out are, we would direct you to the Turks to, to speak do, to their own comments. Do, do you think that he's utilizing this issue maybe to sort of uh, augment his uh, uh, hold on power or you know, things you know, like I, that? I you know, wanna... I, wouldn't, I wouldn't characterize it as that. This was a very serious incident. You know, the President, the Secretary of State, our military leadership have all condemned this failed coup, and we certainly stand with the Turks as they seek to bring perpetrators to justice. You know, that said, we also have talked to them publicly, we've spoken to them privately about the need to do that um, in accordance with due process, rule of law, with, with the freedoms that are guaranteed under Turkey's own constitution. So in terms of, you know, their motives or some of the rhetoric we've seen coming out, um, I'd, I'd direct you to the Turks for And that. finally, how, uh, how would the defection of high-ranking military officers and so on from Turkey, whether to the U.S. or elsewhere, affect this alliance that you have with Turkey? I think our alliance with Turkey, as I, as, as I mentioned, you know, in NATO since 1952, our partnership with Turkey is deep and strong and solid, full stop. Ilhan, hold on, let's go to Ilhan and then I'll go to you, Arshad, okay. sure. if that's okay. Sure. Ilhan. Uh, just the uh, same question, just to follow up. Uh, mm -hmm. This extradition process has been told to Ankara for a long time now. This is this is a very lengthy process. Yes. You know, sometimes it can be months, it can be years. I'm not going to put a timeline on that. And even though this told you, you, you told Turkey about this, President Erdogan just came out yesterday and said either uh, Gulen or Turkey. And also, though you just stated that you have been. Uh, trying to assist Turkey in terms of their investigation or after coup situation. But on the other hand, uh, beginning from President Erdogan, Turkish administration officials have been accusing U.S. that uh, not uh, supporting its ally. And the one thing, the last thing that Secretary Kerry will be maybe coming to Turkey and President Erdogan says. Is there a question in this? Election? Yes. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. It's okay. I'm that, just that's losing. right. That's, uh, so, my, my question is why do you think, even though you have been telling this and explaining this to Ankara, this rhetoric keep uh, coming from Ankara? Again, this goes back to Saeed's question. You know, I'm not going to speak to the comments of foreign leaders. It's up to them to explain. The U.S. position has been very clear Turkey is our friend, it's our partner our NATO ally. We stand with the democratically elected government of Turkey. Can you confirm Secretary Kerry going to Turkey? I have no travel to announce, oh. Gohan. Arshad. To be simple and clear, and this is a question for you. Yeah. 
does the U.S. government believe it needs to choose between its close partnership and alliance with Turkey and Mr. Gulen? Surely the answer is no. Well, I, I wouldn't even characterize it that way. I think that what the U.S. would say is we would live up to our obligations, absolutely, under any extradition treaty. Um, and that is completely separate and part, uh, apart from our deep and abiding partnership with Turkey. You don't believe you need to choose between the we two? We don't need it, obviously not. But I don't even think Thank it's you. a choice, Arshad. I think that the legal process governing extradition is very clear. It's laid out in a treaty. And um, our support um, and partnership for Turkey um, should be unquestioned. And second, you began this briefing by uh, condemning, as I believe multiple U.S. officials already did yesterday, did. Um, the recent attack in Turkey. Two. You then uh, reiterated the multiple, multiple denials of any, uh, well, you, know, you condemned the, the attempted coup and so on. Um, are you getting a little weary of the uh, critical and somewhat uh, belligerent rhetoric from Turkish officials toward the United States? I wouldn't characterize it as that. Um, I would say to, to what I think I said earlier this week, we understand that this was a very serious situation in Turkey. And we understand the government of Turkey is still working through that. Um, what I think my job is, and, and where the United States is, is we want to reassure Turkey that, that um, our partnership remains solid. Another one on this, please. Sure. Um, a Turkish official today said that the Turkish authorities have detained a total of 35,000 22 people in relation to the abortive coup. <clears throat> Just over half of those, or 17,740 people, have since been formally arrested, 11,597 released, and 5,685 remain in custody, but apparently not yet formally, not formally arrested. Is it conceivable to you that 17,740 people could have been involved in plotting a coup that the Turkish intelligence services didn't find out about in advance? I'm not an intelligence agent. I'm, I'm, I'm not um, on the ground. I'm not a member of the government of Turkey. Um, you know, as they continue to work through this, um, I'd refer you there. But again, I would reiterate what we've said before. So we would expect all these investigations fully understanding that they need to hold those accountable for this very grave act and uh, needs to be done with due process in accordance with international norms um, and meeting the, um, the very high level of democratic standards that's enshrined in their own constitution. Is it conceivable to you, <clears throat> even theoretically, that 17,000 people can have collectively plotted a coup? I'm, not, I, I'm just not qualified to answer that. Arshad, I'm really not. Can, can you think of another instance, just off the top of your head, where any country has arrested 17,000 people for one alleged act or event? I'm actually not aware of all of the charges that have been filed against, you know, the number of people you're speaking about, so it wouldn't be appropriate for me to speak to that. Can I just clarify something? The Gulen thing. You said yeah. it's a very <laughs> be a very lengthy process. You said it could take, it could be months, it could, could, could be years. And I you said meaning, I'm not going to speculate on the amount of time. You, yeah, well, it sounds like your message to the Turks is don't hold your breath on this. Well, I think my message is but I, not, I, I would just, But I want to clar clarify something here. Yeah. Is that in the, when, you know, if, if an extradition, is that for the actual review of the extradition request and not including you know, an appeal on be, if it's, an it's, extradition it's the is. Whole process. It's so the whole you're not saying that it's going to take the Justice Department and the State Department. It, it could take years for them to reach an initial decision. It's my understanding on this. with the entire process, can which be includes lengthy. appeals or which, whatever. Which includes the entire. Yes. All right. Is it just possible? I don't know if this is available to find out what the average. You know, what if there's an you average? No, I think that's a question for justice. Exactly, but they don't have briefings. I know, and yeah. I'm here for you. Yeah, so, you know, maybe you could 
call over there. And <laughs> Thanks, Matt. Shake it loose. Are we staying on turkey? Yes. Yeah, yeah, this is also turkey. Hold on. Okay. I'll get to you. Okay. Go ahead, boy. Um, the last time I heard you or any other U.S. official speak about what Russia was doing in Syria, mm -hmm. it was to the effect that most Russian attacks were on on targets uh, on people mm -hmm. other than da Daesh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So my question is, is that still the case as far as you know? And if that is the case, that most Russian targets are other than Daesh, could it be that Turkey is trying to shift what Russia is doing in um, Syria by proposing these joint operations against Daesh? So I'm not going to speculate on Turkey's motives on that. You know, we have been clear, as, as multiple people have said in the past, is that we have been concerned about Russia's strikes in the past. And we've also been very um, clear that if Russia is serious, as I said before, about combating Daesh, you know, that would be that would be very much something that we would continue to stay in dialogue with them on. Um, you're asking about what Turkey's role was in that? You're going to need to speak to Turkish officials. But until now, the U.S. understanding of what Russia's been doing has been that it's largely been attacking targets that are other than the Daesh targets. Our position has not changed on that. And I'm going to you. Just to, sure. Just to make sure I report this correctly, you, you said that um, – uh, what well, you said suggested that the U.S. is fine with Turkey's offer of joint operations. Is that so? Did I understand correctly? Our position is if that Russia is serious about taking the fight to Daesh, that we would welcome having those conversations. Yes. Why isn't the U.S. now carrying out joint operations with Russia? Well, as we've said in the past, and this goes to Lori's point, you know, we've been very unclear what Russia's objectives were in the past. We've spoken about that repeatedly here. You know, this announcement that they've made, that Russia is now uh, recommitting to taking a look at taking the fight against Daesh, you know, that would be something I think we would all welcome. You know, let's see where this goes. Uh, Russia's actions in the past have raised questions. Arshad, do you have a follow-up on this? Um, no. Okay. You, Matt, you wanted to go to Ukraine. Uh, no, I wanted to go to Syria. Okay. Yep. But then I want to go to Ukraine. If that's a lot. We well, will. not physically, but maybe well, not today. Sign a privacy act. <laughs> of course. Uh, have you guys, you guys have seen these reports of another chemical, alleged chemical weapons attack in uh, Aleppo with chlorine? Uh, I'm just wondering if you have any information about that. Yeah, so we are looking into reports of chemical weapons being used against civilians in Aleppo. We take these reports very seriously. We condemn, as we have in the past, any use of chemical weapons. Um, I note we are likewise very concerned about the increasing number of allegations of chemical weapons use over the last few weeks. We have long expressed our strong condemnation of the use of chemical weapons. Use by any party in Syria would violate international standards and norms against such use. Syria is a state party to the Chemical Weapons Convention, and use of any chemical weapons by the Assad regime, as alleged in recent reports in Sarakeb and Aleppo, would violate the convention, as well as UNSCR 2118. All parties must abide by commitments under the cessation of hostilities, including the moratorium on targeting civilians and civilian facilities. The fact remains, as we've said before, there's no military solution. Right. But do you have any reason to, to – you don't have any reason to doubt this report or you, you can't confirm it? You can't, can't confirm it. We continue to gather information. Okay. And does it, does it tell you anything or does it suggest anything that there are this, this – there is this increasing uh, – or there seems to be a trend of – a growing mm -hmm. trend of allegations of the use of, of chlorine? Yeah. As I said, you know, we've noted the trend. We're increasingly concerned about it. We continue to gather information on this. It's something we're monitoring very closely. Can I just follow up on this? Of course. Okay. Have you been, uh, you know, over the past two weeks, you suggested two weeks, over the past two weeks, have you been able to confirm that chemical uh, uh, attacks t took place? We are because not Because the, the Syrian government just issued a very sort of uh, a statement refuting all these allegations. Yeah. So The Syrian uh, government refused The Syrian government, yeah, are, you know, they are party to this conflict. I mean, you, you, you're taking some of the statements or all these statements come basically from opposition groups. 
That, well, that, so we do also take well, statements from people well, on the ground, I'm, medical I'm, professionals, I'm, AIDS groups. What I'm saying that the, the allegations always seem to point to the Syrian government being responsible for these attacks. Have you been able to confirm any of these allegations? We continue to look into reports. We are not in a position to confirm them. Can More? I just ask uh, another question? I'm sorry, we'll get to you now. Yeah. Uh, on Syria, but not sure. chemical related. Uh, the, today, the uh, envoy, Stefan de Mistura, said that what they need is 48 hours mm -hmm. of a ceasefire, not not the three hours of the yeah. proposed. Uh, so could you comment on that? Or? So we talked a little bit about this yesterday, and in our shot actually asked this exact same question. Um, no, it's fine. It's, um, you know, the UN has come out and they've said that the three hours um, are, are not enough, which actually Arshad had, had made that point yesterday. We support the UN on this. Um, you know, our bottom line on this is that aid deliveries should not be subject, you know, to, to well, all aid is good. All pauses are good. I'll reiterate what I said yesterday is that delivery of aid, of humanitarian supplies, of medical supplies, of potable water, it's a fundamental, a fundamental um, access right that all parties need to uh, facilitate moving forward. Or, uh, I'm sorry, Nick, and then I'll get to you. Uh, related to that, have you seen or have you read uh, the letter uh, mm -hmm. some 30 doctors from Aleppo sent to President Obama, which is basically uh, an SOS and also which is uh, uh, asking, which is uh, demanding that the humanitarian pause uh, would be longer than the three hours per day. So a few things on that. Um, I'm not going to speak to sort of the process of the letter or any response, because the letter was to the president, so the White House would respond to that. Um, you know, speaking to the content of the letter, you know, the United States has repeatedly condemned indiscriminate bombing of medical facilities by the Assad, Assad regime in Aleppo and elsewhere in Syria. Uh, the attacks, I think as illustrated in this letter, are appalling. They must cease. We commend the bravery of medical professionals across Syria who are working every day in perilous, per perilous circumstances with minimal supplies to save lives. The U.S. is working continually to address the crisis in Syria through the UN, engaging with Russia and others to find a diplomatic approach to reduce the violence in a sustainable way and allow unimpeded life-saving humanitarian access into places like Aleppo. You know, the conflict in Syria requires a diplomatic political solution. This is the only thing that can end the bloodshed. Just so I'm clear on one thing, are you still all good with the notion of three-hour ceasefires if they actually happen, even though they're you know, any pause is good. Anything that, that cuts the violence, uh, the UN has said they're, they're, they're not workable for them. It's the UN who's, who's bringing the aid in. So in terms of, of technical, you know, of course we support the UN in their work. Um, like, like in, I mean, what I don't understand, I understand that yeah. any pause probably is good for the people who of would course. not be getting bombed. But on the other hand, any pause is not, according to the primary person, you know, institution responsible for delivering the aid sufficient to actually deliver the aid. So I don't understand why you don't make kind of a stronger call for more of a ceasefire rather than three hours, which the U.S. Well, we've been very clear, enough. though, that we believe that a long-term permanent nationwide ceasefire is of vital importance, you know, not only for the people on the ground, but to create that political space so we could have that. Has Secretary Kerry had any phone calls with Foreign Minister Lavrov today or yesterday about this topic or about Ukraine? Um, I have no calls to read out from the Secretary. But back on your original point, I do understand. You or you just answer. don't have anything to say about them if you did call? Um, I have no calls. Are no you calls. sure? I'm positive. So, um, yeah, because in the... Well, but let me answer one thing yeah. on this with Arshad. Uh, um, Arshad, if I have an update, I'll get back to you. But of, of this time, I have no information. Um, However, I do want to point out that we've also seen the reports that the UN is speaking directly with Russia, too, um, taking a look at how to make this a workable uh, humanitarian pause, is the phrase that I've seen. Um, of course, you know, we urge them to come to an agreement as swiftly as possible. I'm sorry, Nick. Uh, just to follow up on that, because in the past, unless mistaken, any any ceasefire, any cessation of hostilities for 48 hours around mm -hmm. Aleppo was 
decided or discussed jointly by mm -hmm. the US and by Russia, yeah. does it mean that this one was a, a unilateral we proposal were not from consulted on the specifics of, of this Russian announcement? So yes, I can confirm that. Let's go here. Yes, um, moving to China. Okay, are we good? Okay, China. Um, the Chinese launched a satellite, uh, which they reported that um, would allow them to monitor uh, their territory, territorial claims in the South China Sea. Do you have a comment on? I, w I would reiterate what we have long said about the South China Sea. So we call on all claimants to use the diplomatic space, the the tribunal, uh, the arbitral uh, tribunal created to have conversations that reduce the rhetoric. Uh, to not engage in provocative actions and engage in a way forward that can resolve these diplomatically. So do you see this launching of the satellite as a... Uh, you know, I'm actually not aware of the satellite launch on that. Go ahead. China. Yeah. Yep, China. Yeah. Uh, in your recent International Religious Freedom Report mm -hmm. released yesterday, uh, it mentioned the case of a Falun Gong practitioner, Wang Jiwen. Yes. Uh, actually, yeah, re very recently he was blocked from traveling to the United States and reunite with his family. Mm -hmm. uh, the customs official just cut his passport into half uh, when he passed through the customs office. Mm -hmm. And so, um, do you have any comments on that? We do. Thank you for the question. We are concerned by reports that Chinese authorities canceled the passport of Wang Jiawen, a Falun Gong practitioner who was released from prison in 2014. We call on the Chinese government to allow him to travel unimpeded. We continue to urge China to protect religious freedom for all in China, including those belonging to members of ethnic and religious minority groups and those who worship outside official state-sponsored institutions. Thank you. Can um, we're, the are, I think we're going to stay on China, and then I'll get to you, Said. Sorry, I wanted to go to Japan. Okay, are you? We'll stay. Religious freedom. Okay, why don't we do religious freedom, then we'll go to Japan. Go ahead. Okay, yesterday in the religious freedom uh, report, Ambassador Saperstein um, described the Middle East as being particularly bad, which is kind of self-evident. The Kurdistan region hosts the majority of refugees and persons displaced by the fighting with Daesh. Mm -hmm. And the United States has declared a, a number of those people hosted by the Kurdistan region as, as being subject to genocidal attack by Daesh, including the Yazidis. So m my question is, what is, how would you evaluate the contribution of the Kurdistan region to uh, promoting tolerance, religious tolerance in the region? Okay. So on specifics on that, I'm going to refer you to the uh, International Religious Freedom Report. I'd say the United States works very closely with the Kurdistan regional government uh, to facilitate help and support those who have been displaced by Daesh. But in terms of, um, you know, uh, assessing their view of tolerance, assessing their view of religious freedom, I'm going to have to refer you to the report. I didn't see that in the report. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, it's, it's, we, so we can, we can gonna, take we can take a look at that, but I, I just have nothing more to well, add. Can just, ask the, the Office of Religious Freedom for uh, answer? I'm happy to take that. Thank or, you. Or, or just say, I'm not going to answer the question. Thanks. Don't refer to a report that doesn't mention it. Well, to be honest, I'm, I'm not aware that it wasn't in the report, so thank you. Go ahead. Um, the Reconstruction Minister, uh, Masahiro Imamura, uh, visited the Yasukuni Shrine, mm -hmm. um, and well, first, do you have a, any comment on that? You know, we have spoken before about visits to the shrine. Um, you know, as, as we've said um, along, that we believe um, it's important to um, be respectful of historical legacies. But I, I would refer you to the government of Japan on that. Would you discourage other uh, ministers from going? I would, I would leave my comments where, we, where, I, where I left them, and I'd refer you to the government to speak to actions of their own ministers, okay? Uh, are we going to Ukraine? Or no, at Said, we'll go there, and then we'll go to Ukraine. I just, very quickly, I want to ask you on the Palestinian issue. Of course. The Palestinian Israel. Uh, first of all, I wonder if you have any comment on Israel's intent to lease uh, privately owned uh, land by Palestinians to relocate uh, the Amona residence uh, outpost. Do you I have do. any comment on Thank that? You. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We're deeply concerned by reports that the Israeli government has begun the process to take over privately owned Palestinian land to relocate the illegal Israeli outpost of Amona. 
This would represent an unprecedented and troubling step that's inconsistent with prior Israeli legal opinions and counter to long-standing Israeli policy to not seize private Palestinian land for Israeli settlement. If this moves ahead, it would effectively create a new settlement or significantly expand the footprint of an existing settlement deep in the West Bank. This is a continuation of a process that has seen some 32 outposts that are illegal under Israeli law being legalized in recent years. I'd note more broadly, and, and this is an important note, say this is a number of trends that have been highlighted in the recent quartet report that are threatening the two-state solution. Uh, those trends also, though, include Palestinian incitement. Along those lines, we're deeply concerned by reports that there was a post on a Fatah Facebook site that boasted about killing Israelis. We understand the page has now been taken down. You know, there's absolutely no justification for any statement that glorifies terrorism or glorifies violence. Incitement to violence is a grave concern. That's why the Quartet Report also calls on Palestinians to act decisively to stop it. On the same topic of settlements, uh, mm -hmm. also the Palestinians claim that, uh, uh, you know, that you are pressuring them not to go, because the Israelis seem to be dismissing, you're, you know, you're, you're urging them to uh, sort of uh, seize the, the uh, settlement expansion and so on, and the expropriation of land. So the Palestinians want to go to the United Nations or the Security Council. They're saying, some reports are suggesting, that you are pressuring them not to do so. And in fact, you are calling on your allies among the Arab nations to do the same thing, to pressure the Palestinians yeah. not to go to the UN. I, I, I wouldn't speak to that, and, and I'm, I certainly wouldn't speak to, um, you know, hypotheticals or, or speculative reports on that. Um, so. And finally. I'm sorry, uh, sorry, one second. Yeah. And I have one, 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 one final thing. Also, the um, my newspaper reported that um, Mahmoud Abbas, or an advisor to Mahmoud Abbas, mm -hmm. Mir Jalani, told them uh, that uh, the PA president claimed that uh, Secretary Kerry, in their last meeting, mm -hmm. suggested to hold a meeting that includes Saudi Arabia, Jordan, United Arab Emirates, Russia, uh, and, and Egypt, of course, and the Palestinians and the Israelis in Egypt. And he rejected that because he felt that this was a way to undermine the French initiative. Do you have any comment on that? So I did see your report, but I'm not aware of any such proposal. As we've said before, we're generally keeping a very open mind about French efforts. We remain in close touch with the French as well as other international partners to continue to discuss ideas, how to move things forward in a constructive direction and bring us closer to achieving peace. Of course. What precisely would be unprecedented if they went ahead with uh, this. It's, it, I believe the, um, let me double check exactly what it is. I believe it's the location, but let me find out our shelf. Okay. Ukraine. Ukraine. Uh, the tension seems to be rising again mm -hmm. uh, between Kiev and Moscow. Um, and I'm w wondering if, what, what, if anything, are you um, counseling both sides, and what, if anything, are you prepared to do to prevent this from exploding, okay. essentially? So thanks. We are extremely concerned about the increased tension near the administrative boundary between Crimea and Ukraine. Our position, as I said yesterday, um, is well known. Crimea is part of Ukraine and is recognized by such, as such by the international community. Um, in question on, on actions, we call for the avoidance of any actions uh, that would escalate the situation there. Uh, we continue to remain in close touch with international partners on this, um, but, but we believe now is the time to um, reduce the tensions, reduce the rhetoric, and, and get back to talks. So ha, 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 is there anything particular in, in particular that you can point to but by either any, by any of the sides involved um, that has escalated tensions. I, has I believe, you know, I would I would point back to we believe that any actions, you know, including rhetoric, including um, remarks, um, have the ability to escalate what is already a very tense situation and a very dangerous situation. But can you write, can you talk specific? Can you name specifically if there has been if or what you see as an action or 
a use of rhetoric that has? I think we've seen it actually um, coming out of Moscow. Um, we've seen, you know, a rhetoric where um, accusations have been lobbed. We've seen um, tensions um, spike on that administrative boundary. Um, so it's time to take a step back. We call on all sides to reduce. Okay, so so all of the actions that you that you believe are escalating the, the tensions have come from the Russian side. I wouldn't characterize it as that. We we call on any actions, an avoidance of any action. Okay, today the uh, Ukraine put its troops on alert yeah. uh, in the Donbass. Is that something that escalates tensions, or is that, in your view, something that's a legitimate action? You know, we've to... we've seen those reports. I'm going to refer you to the Ukrainians um, to speak on that. You know, we have seen a recent spike in violence in eastern Ukraine, and combined with the Russian-backed forces' systematic denial of unfettered OSCE access um, to the monitors, I would point out that, that this is, um, as I mentioned, this is a very tense time. Um, we do understand that there is violence, and we do recognize Ukraine's um, right to defend itself and defend its own citizens. Um, in terms of how they mobilize their forces, I'm going to refer you to the Ukrainians to speak well, to that, though. Yeah, but so if I call the Ukrainians, there, I mean, that doesn't make any sense to me. I'm just asking, I mean, if I wanted, wanted details of what they were actually doing on the ground, mm -hmm. then I might do that. But I'm asking whether the United States, which has, which you, you <coughs> has accused the Russians of escalating the, the rhetoric, escalating mm -hmm. the tensions, believes that this move by the Ukrainians is also escalating. We, we, we actually are calling for a reduction in all action. So this would be included? Yes. Okay. Thank so you. Can I you recall the Russians' decision to, or their announcement that they are going to hold military exes, uh, exercises in the region as um, something that raises tensions? Well, we've seen uh, the Russian statements about military exercises in the Black Sea. Is that your question? Yeah, the Black Sea exercises. Yeah. I mean, we've received no information from the Russian Federation regarding the purpose of that activity other than what's appeared in the press and official Russian public statements. Um, as we have in the past, we expect Russia to fulfill all relevant commitments to provide neighbors with appropriate assurance and transparency about the size and character of its activities. Um, with all exercises, um, including these, any activity must be consistent with international law and with due regard for the rights of other nations. Um, in terms of the scale, scope, size, we'll refer you to the Russians to speak to it. But given the tensions with Ukraine, is this a good time for Russia to be doing military exercises, period, even in the Black Sea? You know, as we've said, we've just actually received no information on the purpose of it. All we've seen the same reports you have. Are we going to stay on Ukraine? Of course. Is there any merit to Russia's uh, accusation that the Ukrainians have been plotting terrorist uh, activities in the Crimea. Uh, they have plotted to assassinate the president uh, of Lugansk, you know, the popular Lugansk area, uh, uh, which is not recognized, uh, Igor Plutensky, and so on. Is there any merit in these accusations? That you know, I, I haven't seen the details of that. I have no information on it. Uh, we'd reiterate again that Crimea is part of Ukraine. Goyal. I have two questions on South Asia. One, of course. Uh, I know the report came out yesterday, and uh, you already spoke about this. My question is that uh, after two, more than two years of uh, Prime Minister Modi's government, uh, how many points out of ten do you give to his government as far as religious tolerance or religious freedom in India is concerned under his leadership in India? You know what? Ambassador Saperstein actually spoke at length about this during his brief, that particular question, so I'd point you to his transcript on that. But how does uh, Secretary Kerry uh, think and feel now as far as how he's dealing with the Indian counterparts or India? Uh, again, Goyal, you know, we, we actually spoke about this exact question at length, so I'm not going to rehash it. And, you uh, had another question? Uh, yeah, and uh, two related. One, as far as this unity between uh, uh, Taliban and ISIS in mm -hmm. Afghanistan, uh, that is creating problem for the democratic elected government in Pakistan of Nawaz Sharif because 
Pakistanis blaming that these are the uh, Afghan Taliban's or un un unity and Afghanistan is saying that they have come from across the border from Pakistan. So at the same time, Imran Khan is also calling resignation of Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif and that is putting more um, pressure on the military and uh, also on the democratic elected government of Nawaz Sharif. So where uh, this uh, triangle stands and what message do you have for the uh, elected government in Pakistan and also this uh, unit, uh, uh, Afghan Taliban or uh, ISIS? So we've actually spoken to the, the um, reports of the Taliban and ISIS joining together. We spoke about that on Monday. Um, in terms of our conversations, we've been very clear with the highest level of the Pakistani government that Pakistan must target all groups. Um, I'd note that General Sharif actually spoke to this very recently. You know, Pakistan and the broader region stability requires that military threats be addressed in a comprehensive way. Instability in Afghanistan is not in Pakistan's interest. It will undermine, as you note, the significant progress that the Pakistan military has made in shutting down terrorist safe havens. Thank and you. that's it? No, 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 no. Okay. I was looking well, at you, Matt. <laughs> well, is there anyone else? I mean, I don't want to. No, I think we're good. Okay. Um, I want to return to something that we were talking about yesterday at some length, which is the latest, these latest emails that um, fantastic. Uh, were yep. fantastic. Yep. Oh, okay. <laughs> Funny, that's not the response I expected. But, um, anyway, uh, I wanted to return to the question about whether or not the, the emails in question um, that, uh, uh, that the appearance of any impropriety in the of impropriety in emails that were released, I wanted to ask if that if the department had looked looked into those uh, looked into the, to that to those appearances and um, come to a determination one way or another about whether anything that happened was actually improper. Okay. Are you speaking about? I'm the speaking question? about both issues that we were talking about yesterday. One, the hire, the recommendation mm -hmm. of someone to be hired, and then secondly, the um, foundation asking uh, for a meeting to be right. set up. Well, let me speak to the personnel issue first. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, as I said yesterday, we won't speak to specific personnel decision. Um, I do have more clarification, though. The name of the individual being referred to was redacted under FOIA for privacy reasons. At the beginning of the administration, at the beginning of an administration, um, we receive recommendations for aspiring employees from a great many places and sources. The department does not believe it was inappropriate for Mr. Band or any other individual to recommend someone be considered for employment at the State Department. We also do not believe it's inappropriate for someone recommended in this matter to be potentially hired insofar as they meet the necessary qualifications for the job. Um, as I explained yesterday, individuals can be and are proposed for political appointee positions by a wide variety of sources. This is not unique to this administration. Former Secretary Clinton staff have stated that this individual was not a Clinton Foundation donor or employee, but even such a history would not have precluded an individual from employment with the department. The State Department follows a standard procedure when hiring political appointees. Pursuant to statute, the Office of Personnel Management issues authorizations granting agencies the authority to hire a limited number of non-career appointees, often referred to as Schedule C or political appointments. There are more than a thousand Schedule C positions throughout the federal government. State Department has been using this authority for decades through all administrations. Individuals are reviewed for security clearance eligibility and suitability and are placed according to their educational and work experience in the appropriate positions and at the appropriate pay grades. It is not at all surprising that individuals at state, and for that matter, all other agencies who have the same OPM granted authority, can be brought into government using such authorities. We are confident that our hiring decisions are made in the best interest of the department and U.S. government. So, bottom line on that one, on that one of two issues, is that uh, the the department does not, this is quoting you, the department does not believe it was inappropriate for Mr. Ban to make the recommendation. That's the Correct. bottom line. Okay. Uh, and then secondly, on mm -hmm. the other issue. Yep. 
So while I can't speak, as I mentioned yesterday, to that specific e email, or as you know, we've made it a policy not to speak to these, um, I do know a spokesperson for this individual um, has indicated he ultimately had no contact with the State Department officials on this topic. That said, as we said yesterday, State Department officials are regularly in touch with a range of outside individuals and organizations including nonprofits, NGOs, think tanks, and others. Um, the nearly 55,000 pages of Secretary Clinton's emails released by the Department over the past year give a sense of the wide range of individuals inside and outside the government that State Department officials are in contact with on a range of topics. The Department's actions under Secretary Clinton were taken to advance administration policy as set by the President and in the interests of American foreign policy. The State Department is not aware of any actions that were influenced by the Clinton Foundation. Any action at all over the course of um, Secretary Clinton's tenure? Correct. That's a rather sweeping statement. Do it you is. I think everyone's aware of um, the scrutiny uh, that this department is under. Um, you know, we would obviously take um, any questions seriously. I think you are all aware of that. Um, I stand by my statement. Right, but I mean, the question has, the question has been raised just in the last two days. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just wanting to make sure that people have looked at this and okay. determined that there was no impropriety. That correct. is correct. Okay, and then, sorry, last one, just on the first, first issue. Yeah. Um, you still cannot say whether or not this anonymous redacted person for privacy reasons was in fact hired? Correct. The Privacy Act limits our ability to comment on the hiring process. As such, we cannot speak to specific personnel decisions. The name of the individual being referred was redacted under FOIA for privacy reasons. That the name was, but you can't also... And we can't speak to specific personnel decisions, which I mentioned yesterday. Okay, so the only way that one could tell if one was not working for the department, if someone did get hired or not, is all of a sudden if they show up, to start showing up in the building so to work every day? So it would be for uh, the podium that I would not be able to speak to it for the privacy. Okay. Can you confirm that you were hired by the State Department? I would not be standing here otherwise. <laughs> okay. So you can speak, then you can speak about personnel. It's, it's, sort of, it's sort of like the cat. I'm here. You can see me. You can right, confirm exactly. it for yourself. You're aware of reports that I'm standing here briefing for you. Can you confirm that was hired by the State Department. And you know what? That was a fantastic hire. So I, so I would say. Well, you know all right. All, but all joking aside. No, it I is. Mean, because, so of, because we cannot speak to specific personal actions. I'm sorry. Well, you just spoke to you just spoke to both yours and his. That's right? all I've got for you. Thanks, okay. guys. Uh, oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Wait, we have we have a, a brief one on this. Oh. Yeah. What, what's your take on the very offensive comment? made by the Indonesian presidency against uh, LGBT people saying that there is, quote, no room for gays in, uh, in Indonesia. So we've seen that, and we're also aware and closely monitoring reports of possible measures in Indonesia that would restrict the freedom of expression for LGBTI individuals. In principle and in practice, the United States government will always strive to protect and advance the universal right of all people, including LGBTI individuals, to express themselves both online and offline. We encourage Indonesia, which rightly prides itself on diversity and tolerance, to respect and uphold international rights and standards by ensuring equal rights and protections for all of its citizens. So Thank you. To say, this is a bad idea. We are, um, we are very closely monitoring reports and we're in close contact with our friends. Thank you. Thanks, Scott.